This is Jenny Larson conducting my first interview with Gina Houston at her mom's house on uh, 22nd, Street. 22nd Street. And this East, interview... East 22nd Street. East 22nd Street, <laughs> important to clarify. And this interview is part of the Conversations to Create Unity oral history project conducted by the Susanna Dickinson Museum and Baylor University. So let's start with just talking about your sort of, you know, personal life experience, when were you born, where were you born, all of that stuff. Okay, I was born on December 17, 1968 at Old Seton Hospital in Austin, Texas. It's where the, I think it's where the H-E-B, the big H-E-B at Hancock Center is. I think that used to be Seton Hospital, some part of that plot. So I've been there my whole life. I'm an Austinite. <laughs> I'm very proud to be an Austin. I really am. Um lived on in East Austin all my life. I did go to private school at St. Andrews Episcopal School, which is over by North Lamar. And then after sixth grade, I went to Murkison High School. We were bused back then. So most of the kids from this area of town were bused out to West Austin to try to uh, increase the diversity in the schools. So I was bused to Murkison Junior High School and then to L.C. Anderson High School in West Austin, which is interesting because my mother graduated from Elsie Anderson in East Austin, which was the segregated high school for for black children. So we went to the same high school, technically, but, but totally we don't. different, to totally different cultures and different mascot and all that kind of stuff. So what was that experience of, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting I have to have a word list, so I'm getting out my notebook. What was your experience of that sort of the busing situation and... And how, what was that like? It was, it was interesting because, um, I grew up middle class and then I went to a private school in, in pretty much in West Austin. So then I was in school with these rather wealthy Anglo children <laughs> and, and for most of the, my elementary school career, I was the only black person at the school. My, my brother was ahead of me three years and there was a another young lady in town, Dee Dee was ahead of me two and a half years, something like that. So for five years, four or five years in elementary school, I was the only black child in the school. <laughs> so it was a little interesting to go from that to sitting on a bus for 40, about 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the afternoon, going all the way to Murkison High School and then coming all the way back and then going all the way to Anderson High School and going all the way back. I was a big reader, so I did a lot of reading on the bus, but being in the public school system was just different, and different kids and different priorities in life, and you know, kind of, why are you acting like you're white, da, 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 and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, I'm just trying to read Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to do. So it was, it was, it was not pleasant for me. I was, I, I did not have fun junior high school and high school. I was not. I had some fun. I don't want to feel like I was. <laughs> Penelope or something, but it just wasn't, it wasn't what I would have liked high school and junior high school to be. So talk to me a little bit more about that elementary school experience of mm -hmm. being the only person of color in the school. What was that like? <laughs> it was very interesting. It was very interesting. Um, I, I haven't thought about it in a long time. It was very interesting. And, and to be perfectly honest, the, the custodian was black too. Which was another, which was an interesting relationship because he was very kind of supportive of the children that came through with color, speaking to him in the hall and, and you know, just letting them know that it was okay with all these. I mean, it was kind of overwhelming sometimes. Um, the questions that I would get, we'd go to the swimming pool and I thought you people didn't float. And, 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 and I'm going to be honest that it wasn't, I don't believe that it was done out of spite or anything like that. It was just that these people had never been around people of African descent. They just had never been around them. So then they heard stories or they listened to tales or, or maybe jokes that adults were saying. And so then they came to me with these questions and, and I would do my best to answer them without being upset or. <laughs> yeah. Cause that was going to be my next question is how do you handle, how do you respond to that kind of ignorance? You just kind of, sometimes you just kind of look at them blankly, like, think about what you just asked me <laughs> and you go on or the other, t other times you kind of go, well, my dad taught me to swim. Who taught you to swim? <laughs> kind of 
trying to figure out how to because of the way I was raised, I knew that that kind of stuff would go on. And so my family tried to prepare me for dealing with that. And that you just have to make people understand that we're all people. Even though we look different, we're all people. And we all kind of have the same experiences in general. And so who taught you to swim? My dad. My dad taught me to swim too. Just the same kind of thing. Um, I always want to touch your hair. I don't know what that's about. People always want to touch hair. <laughs> so sometimes I'd be like, yeah, sure. And sometimes I'd be like, no, it's my hair. It's my personal space. Don't touch my hair. So that makes me think about, um, you know, our mutual friend, Adrian Dawes, mm -hmm. also talks a lot about, like, everyone wants to touch my hair. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously very common for mm -hmm. black women to have that question, mm -hmm. even as adults. And so that made me think these sort of ignorant questions that a child can ask and and request and all of these things. And I'm sure that they still happen mm -hmm. as an adult. Um, do you want to speak to that? Um, it's getting a lot better. It's getting a lot better. And I'm going to be perfectly honest. Part of it is um, that YouTube um, series where the lady is talking about what white people should know. She started that, I guess, 10, 15 years ago. And she was just answering these questions. She was just saying, look. Do not ask me to touch my hair. My hair is just like your hair. It just has a different texture. So find one of your friends that has hair that looks like mine and ask them to touch it. <laughs> but it doesn't happen as much as it used to. I think because of the media and how connected people are now, that not quite as much. Every now and then, something strange. One, there was a lady at work who's the sweetest lady in the world. One of my, I consider one of my mentors at work. Just sweet. She and mom were born in the same year, born in the same month went to segregated high schools and they just kind of have the same kind of mindset about stuff. <clears throat> and we were talking about something and, and I said, you know, just all of this, whether or not Obama's an American. And she went, well, he's not. And it just kind of stopped me. It kind of, <laughs> kind of stopped me and my heart just skipped a bit. And I went, what do you mean he's not? Well, he's, he's not American. He was born in Africa. And it's like, no, sweets. He was born in Hawaii after Hawaii became a state. Plus, his mother was born in Kansas. So even if he had been born in Africa, he's an American because his parent is an American. So it's just every now and then something, and I don't know if it's because people choose not to educate themselves or if it's just easier to not think about people in a certain way. And, and I guess that would be true. It would probably be easier to say everybody that's like me is right and regular and normal and all these other people are strange. I think it probably takes some energy to, to reach out and open so. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I took us way into the future, which was, we can come back to, <laughs> but I kind of want to stick to this sort of personal life a little bit okay. more, which, so I wondered, talk about your neighborhood growing up and then your neighborhood now and you know just start with growing up and what that was like and you know as vividly descriptive as you want to okay. be and then we'll move into the future okay you know. <laughs> or um, the present the let's present say. um this was east 22nd street all this kind of area between um i guess 18th street and Manor road um east of i-35 has has really been kind of a middle class area so everybody that I kind of was around was kind of middle class. There's some low income housing pockets, um, but the majority of people are, are kind of middle class. So growing up, I didn't think that I was any different than anybody else anywhere else in town. Um, I did notice when I went to friends' houses that they had sidewalks. We didn't have sidewalks. We had our little street, we had a little street lights that would shine down and you had to be home before the street lights came on. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was, it was Austin. In the 70s, nobody cared about anything really. Everybody was safe. Nobody was robbing and beating up people. And you just had to be in before dark because you had to make sure your homework was done. You'd done your chores before you went to bed. It wasn't anybody was really worried about you. And it was just, it was, it was, it was nice. It was one of those, I do, I do believe that my kind of environment growing up as a kid was just, was just nice. You know, we had, this was my, my, grandparents house in the front and we had the trailer in the back where my mom and my brother and I stay in the trailer and it was just kind of we had a little compound you know it was kind of cool it was kind of cool so that part of growing up was was okay um then getting into the 80s they uh started talking about a lot of gang violence 
and it was, you know, big serious problem on the West Coast, big serious problem on the East Coast. Not so much a problem in the South, um, at least not at that time. Not so much a problem in the South. There was a little trouble in Houston and Dallas, but Austin really did not see a lot of gang activity. We had little groups of boys and girls that would form cliques and do stupid stuff, but not like sub, what do you call those? Submachine guns or semi-automatic machine guns. And, and we had crack houses. We knew where the crack houses were. We knew who the crack addicts were. Um, you know, and they would come by. And this is kind of before we knew how bad the crack addiction was. People would come to your door and I, oh, I need five dollars, and you give them five dollars. Whereas, you know, today somebody comes to your door asking for five dollars, you're like, you're up to no good. Just stay away. I don't have anything to do with you. But, but it was, it was just kind of normal. It was. I started getting fearful because of how the news was reporting my neighborhood, and thinking, well, they're saying that this is happening, and and there's this kind of violence going on and the children aren't safe. And, and so then I started to get nervous about where I lived because of what I was hearing from the outside and having to balance that with what my reality really was, was difficult. It was hard for kids to kind of go, well, they just are taking that from some other source. They're not really looking at Austin. They're saying this is where most of the people of color live. So this is probably what's going on over there. So that was not fun. The eighties was not fun. I remember. And then the whole, the whole Cold War thing and just being, you just kind of felt scared all the time and just nervous and you didn't know what was going to happen. And that's about the time I was getting bussed out to Murkison Junior High School. And that was a whole nother thing again, because now I was in a public school where I had people of color who had never known anyone that was black and middle class. So then they were, <laughs> they were completely confused about me. And well, what do you, once again, why do you think you're white and taking honors classes and you're not that smart and just ignorance and stupidity. But it, it also fed into that kind of fear because you didn't ever really know when somebody was going to take offense to your being, which is an interesting place to be on, be in that someone is offended by the fact that you exist. And that comes from their fear and their, their, um, I don't want to say despair, but their, their lack of vision for their future and saying, well, it may be that she actually does something with her life. And I don't think I ever will that kind of thing. And interestingly enough, I got that from Anglos and from black children, which was new and interesting because the, the, the Anglo kids that I went to St. Andrews with, they, you know, they didn't work. I mean, they knew what they were doing when they were going to college. They were doing this. They were doing, they're going to have to go on the cruise over spring break. They knew what they were doing. So they weren't worried about it. But these kids at Markson, some of them were bused from some poor areas of Austin. And people forget that too, is that we have these communities of Anglos who were in, in, um, desperate straits. They're, you know, basically housing projects. Um, so they were out there too. And they had that same kind of of offense. They were just offended. And then for them, it was twofold because not only did I seem to know what was happening in my life, but then I was black. So then now you're really not right. So I kind of always felt I was, I never felt in the school system that I had a place. I was just kind of in the middle of whatever, everything else was going on. And so that was the eighties. And then I went to Anderson high school and that was another because growing up my whole life, I'd been talk, talked about the Yellow Jackets and they were state football champions and state band champions and all this other stuff going on. I went out to Anderson out on the far west and it's just not the same. It's just not the same. The sense of community and and everybody just kind of rallying around the school that just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't like that at Anderson for some reason. It was just kind of kids go to school because they have to go to school and their parents come and pick them up and it just never felt like we're, we're Trojans. Arr! Just never felt like that. So that was interesting. And then we finally got sidewalks in 2000 and something. So we've just had sidewalks for about 15, 20 years. And it was very interesting because about the time that we started seeing a lot of Anglos moving into town is when we started to seeing all these infrastructure changes, more street lights. Um, sidewalks, curbs, there were some streets that didn't have curbs, um, getting, um, 
traffic lines painted into streets that didn't have traffic lines before. You just kind of knew you stayed on the right. Um, having the water pipes redone. You know, and I'm growing up here, I've never seen them dig up a street and do a water pipe. And then all of a sudden, everywhere I look, all these pipes are being refitted to make way for the McMansions and <laughs> all these people that are coming. And then Maina Road started to change. We used to have a little grocery store, mom and pop grocery store, um, right there where Hoover's is, Maina Road. Um, yeah, there used to be a mom and pop grocery store. You'd go get your lettuce and your spinach. You know, my grandmother would be cooking and, oh, I'm out of pinto beans. Run up the store and get some pinto beans. And we'd go get pinto beans. And it was just kind of a neighborhood. And now it's become this commercial project kind of thing. And even at the point when I was in junior high school and high school, we had a church's chicken on the corner of Main Road and 22nd Street. There was a church, I mean, it was a church's chicken. It was like a big deal when the church's chicken came. <laughs> well, but it was good because not only did it bring some jobs, it brought some jobs in the neighborhood. And then you had fast food. For the first time, there was some fast food, but we still also had the grocery store where you would go go get a box of chicken, but you'd also go get some carrots and some peas and some, you know, sustenance, you know, real food. So it still wasn't as bad as, as some of the neighborhoods are today where they have four fast food restaurants and then the, the produce is two miles away. So that was interesting. So now Manor Road is this kind of industry of, of restaurants and um, I think we have a little pub down there now. We've got the um, theater. Vortex has been there forever though. It's been there for a long time. So we consider that one of our old neighbors. <laughs> but it's the other really interesting thing is to is to watch these houses that were these middle class people of color were living in that they had built. You know, they had built these houses with their sweat and toil after during Jim Crow and segregation, they had managed to buy some land and build a house and the property taxes started going up and then their descendants couldn't keep their houses. So then somebody says, oh, I'll pay you two hundred fifty thousand dollars for your house. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And so you sell your house to this business and they build this restaurant that's bringing in $250,000 a year, if not a quarter, you know, some of them. And just watching how those changes have happened and saying, oh, I remember when Miss Jenkins used to live there and I remember when Miss Wyatt used to live over there and, and now it's this booming business, which I'm not, I'm not mad at them. You know, it's wonderful. There's just not, if you have a, four bedroom house, four bedrooms and two baths, parking for that house is probably four cars at the most. And you have maybe a thousand people coming through the neighborhood a day. And then more than that on the weekends. And then cars are just up and down the streets everywhere going both directions. And we have the sidewalks now. So the streets are not as wide as they were. <laughs> so it's really hard to, to kind of navigate the neighborhood these days. And you get frustrated, you know, when I, when I come over to visit my mom and I can't park anywhere, it just kind of makes you frustrated. You're like, get out of my neighborhood, <laughs> go back where you came from. Especially when you remember people wouldn't come. People were like, oh no, you live on the east side. I can't, I can't come over there. And you know, does your car get broken into and all this other kind of stuff where you're going, well, no, it's just like where you live. It's just not a lot of white people. It's a lot of black people. That's the only difference really. Um, so, so you do get, you did, there's some bitterness. There's some bitterness about, about that transformation from a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood to, um, a parking lot kind of parking lot kind of situation. And the fact that we have people who are moving in that are really, really wealthy. And so are building, huge houses on these small lots, I mean, tiny lots, half the size of our lot. And they've got, you know, two story, four bedroom, two and a half bath. Plus then they still want to have a yard in the back and they still want to have a yard in the front. And then they only have parking for one car. So there's a little bitterness about that, but I still love my neighborhood. I want to come back <laughs> if I could afford to. <laughs> I know that, that remains the question, right? Can you afford to stay? Oh man, it's pretty crazy. So, uh, I had, I, there were a lot of different things that you said that I thought were, um, you know, just like piqued my curiosity. 
Uh, so I'm kind of strained from my list. I'll come back to it. But this idea of news forming reality mm -hmm. as opposed to news being reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered if you could talk to that a little bit more. That's probably one of the biggest pet peeves I have with media is that a story happens and it seems that nowadays media makes a decision about the story that happened and then they talk about that story based on the decision they've made. Not just who, what, when, where, why, but who, what, when, where, why, and this is the reason behind that and the motivation for it was and this is what the effect is going to be. And you're kind of like, well, you don't really know that. So because there's gang violence in L.A., then there's got to be gang violence in East Austin. has to be happening. There's crack because we, we have um, police reports and hospital reports that people are using crack in East Austin. Probably in all of Austin, people are using crack. But we know that it's happening in East Austin because it's happening in L.A. with the black folks. And it's happening in D.C. And, and New York with these people of color. So it must be happening with these people of color in, in East Austin. Um, when if one of those news reporters came down and any of the kids, any of us kids could tell them where the crack house is. Oh, the crack house is right over there. We'd walk them over. We'd say, oh, yeah, and this is Tommy. Tommy is so-and-so's brother from such and such, such and such. And it just wasn't the kind of New Jack City kind of situation that the media was trying to make it into, which is really unfortunate because then the media tells you that you're living in a certain kind of environment and then you dream of a different environment. And then someone comes and gives you $250,000 for your house so that you can get that environment in Georgetown or Pflugerville or Round Rock. And then you come back 15, 20 years later, and there's this $450,000, $500,000 house, the mansion kind of thing, sitting where your house used to be that you grew up in, that your parents built. And that just drives me, drives me over the wall. So... I wonder if you can speak to this sort of, this idea of this false reality and then your experience with these white kids at this elementary school and you had said, you know, that they would say, well, we can't come over. I wonder mm -hmm. if you can speak to maybe some, how that affected you personally or a story and how that affected you personally. Well, I guess I used to get, um, and, and that's one of the great things about this private school was that even though these children were sheltered and hadn't been around people of color, once they were around me, they weren't necessarily exclusive. Um, I mean, they didn't exclude me necessarily. I got invited to a lot of slumber parties and just regular parties and, and my mom would take me, I would go and have a great time. And then I get the bright idea, well, I'm going to have a slumber party in my house. Send the invitations out, everything's great. And I didn't get anybody saying that they could come. And so when I asked, the answer was, well, my mom, my mom and dad don't think I should be in that part of town at night. And I'm going, well, why not? I'm in that part of town at night. I'm always in that part of town at night. So what's the big deal? And really just not understanding, because I didn't really watch the news with any kind of intention. It would just be on while I was reading a book or drawing or whatever. So it would just be on. But then I remember hearing, you know, another death from gang violence in East Austin when it was somebody's cousin's friend who was... Um, playing with a gun, should not have been playing with a gun, and ends up shooting somebody. But it wasn't gang violence, it was an accidental shooting, which is how it would be reported from West Austin, but from East Austin, it's gang violence, rival gangs. Or if it was somebody from LBJ got into a fight with somebody from Reagan, then it was gang violence, not just, these is, this is a school feud, it's gang violence. Um, so that was, that started to generate fear once I started to actually listen to the news and try to figure out what, what was going on in the world. It just was not, it was not fair. It wasn't fair to, to feel like your, your home was less than somebody else's home just because of the location. And how did your family talk to you about that? Or did you talk to them about those feelings? We, we are a, well, not we, but my family is, is very political. They like politics. I don't like politics at all. They just don't. You know, I fall in love with politicians because they're, they're these larger than life charismatic people. But the whole politics thing, it just, it, I don't understand. It. it makes me angry. That's stupid. You know that that's not the truth. Why are you saying it? So I don't do politics. But my family was very political. So they would have these conversations. And we had family dinner 
And so we're sitting down at family dinner and they're having these conversations about, you know, uh, this town that's still segregated or this town that is, is um, telling black folks that they can't live there. And they'd have these conversations and talk about the latest, um, the latest decision that Thurgood Marshall had or Andrew Young was, was doing something at the UN. And so they, we just had those kind of conversations because that's who my, my parents and grandparents were. And in the course of those conversations, there would be like a pause in the conversation and someone would look at you and go, now, you know, if a man comes up to you and says X, Y, Z, then your proper response is whatever. I mean, it was just kind of woven into the fact of our of our lives at home. I remember very clearly my mother telling my brother, if a police officer stops you, you do exactly what they say, exactly when they say it, and then you call me as soon as you can. But you do not resist, you do not talk back, you do not run, you do not in any way make it seem as if you are threatening the police officer. Because in actual fact, you could lose your life for for nothing, for walking down the street, playing with the basketball, and the basketball rolling into the street as a police, police officer sees that, lights are on, stopping you, questioning you. So it was, it was partly about survival, how to navigate in the Anglo world. It's one of the things that, that they always talked about when you're, when you're speaking. There's, there's a way that you talk in the neighborhood, there's a way that you talk at home, there's a way that you talk at school, and then there's a way that you talk in public. And those are all different languages, and you have to know all of those languages and when you're, when you're able to use them at different times. So it was just kind of, it was about survival and knowing how to navigate waters that are, that are um, unclear, that are muddy. I remember even to this day, I will not go to the Broken Spoke. People ask me all the time, to go to the Broken Spoke. And I'm just like, no, not going to Broken Spoke. Even after my mom finally went to the Broken Spoke, <laughs> she said, oh, I had a great time. I'm like, I have some kind of visceral response to, to even thinking about going anywhere where a rebel flag is displayed. You know, just having this kind of visceral response, which is interesting enough because I don't, I don't think that Travis High School should have to not use their rebel flag because that's who, they're the rebels. They're the rebels. That has a completely different connotation from a rebel flag just being hanging in a saloon says something completely different than having that be your mascot. So it was, it was about navigation. It was just kind of, I don't know, it was a very good conversation kind of. I don't. Yeah, that's great. Actually, it's such a good segue because the next thing I was going to sort of talk about is just like politics in your life and activism and, and interaction with law enforcement. And so you sort of talking exactly the direction we wanted to go. That's great. Um, and so I, I wondered if you could sort of um, speak to maybe your own um, experiences with activism growing up. Um, I'm also very interested in this navigating the Anglo world and, and how that still affects you in present day. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think maybe you could speak to would it, would it, whatever of those two things you're most inclined to answer first. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's do the at navigating the Anglo world because I'm trying to, in my head try to think about the activism because I know what happened. I just think I've chosen to file that away and really not important. So I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. So navigating um, the Anglo world. And how does that affect me today? I think that I've been very fortunate that I had that kind of instruction um, and modeling growing up because it has it has it has made a difference in a lot of ways in a lot of places. Um, the 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 thing that's most hilarious to me in life is that if I talk to somebody on the phone and make an appointment to go see them or something, and then I walk in the room and just for a split second, their eyes get bit. <laughs> Just for a split second. And I always go, they thought I was white. I know they thought I was white. <laughs> Which is hilarious to me. It's just, it's just hilarious that you would just... And I guess that's strange because I can usually tell from someone's voice what, what their ethnic background is. Even if they're very articulate and enunciate very well, there's just a t timbre in the voice that you can kind of pick out. But people just can't pick that out with me for some reason. So that's hilarious to me. Then being able to be articulate, that used to be the worst insult. 
when we were growing up was the worst insult you could say to a black child that, oh, you're so articulate. Because it was kind of like, and why shouldn't I be? Why does that surprise you that I'm articulate? Kind of thing. Um, but having, being able to be that person helps me to navigate with someone who hasn't been around people of color, just the language, being able to speak their language, a language that they're familiar with. This, these are the words that I hear from my parents and my family, then that puts them a certain sense of ease. So it's easier to kind of interact. Um, what else? It's just a different kind of, different kind of game playing, <laughs> which I know seems horrible, but it just, there's a different kind of game playing. I, I really think politics was invented by people from the Caucasoid Mountains because I just, there's just nothing like that as far as I can tell in African cultures in terms of, of saying what you want someone to hear so that you can get what you want, even though you know you're not going to do what you said. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of, and that may be really racist on my part, <laughs> maybe really racist. I just haven't found evidence of that in, in cultures from, from African descent. And it must be because we have, we have countries that are, that are run by people of African descent. So there has to be some in there. I just, it's one of those things that I think about in my head that are probably really stupid. Okay. So <laughs> activism, <laughs> um, my grandfather was actually on one of the advisory committees or some kind of, he wasn't like a cabinet member. It wasn't anything that kind of official, but it was some kind of advisory board to President Johnson. Um, you know, one of those yellow dog Democrats, really hardcore, just, we're going to get this, we're going to fix it, we're going to make it right. Your vote is your voice, and you got to get out there and, and vote and go into walk in the neighborhoods to get people registered to vote or to campaign for somebody that was running. Um, my grandmother was a mentor to Gonzalo Barrientos. So working on his campaigns, being in campaign offices, knowing how you hand out flyers and you have to bundle this and you have to, you know, just the logistics of running a campaign. Um, watching the city council when we got the closed, Austin closed TV circuit, whatever that's called, CCC, CCTV and watching the city council. And it was like a big deal. City council's on. We're going to watch city council. <laughs> like, I'm going, why are we watching these people? These, these people, and there's one black person, there's one person of Latin descent, and I really don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. So watching that, um, uh, when I was in sixth grade, I believe, the spring semester of my sixth grade year, I was a Senate page because of the relationship with, with Senator Barrientos. They used to have actual an actual school where the seventh graders, sixth and seventh graders, I think, would go for that spring semester and have classes in the mornings and then serve the Senate in the afternoons. Well, I guess sometimes it would switch. It would depend on when they actually came into session. When the Senate floor was in session, then we actually sat in these little chairs. They still have Senate pages now, but now they're college students. And we'd sit in these chairs and we'd just kind of wait until a senator had something that needed to go back to their office or they needed to have copies made or they needed to talk to this representative or they needed, we were just gophers basically. And so I'm sitting in the Texas Senate chamber while they're doing stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was that kind of stuff. I'm just, it, it just seems like I fell into this, this family that loves this stuff. <laughs> and I really don't, <laughs> and I really don't. It just, it makes me crazy in the head sometimes to listen to people talk about this stuff. So it was that kind of involvement. My, 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 um, grandfather was a me member of the lions club. So they did a lot of activism. My grandmother and my mother were members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. They did a lot of service activities. They were members of links International. It's a lot of service activities. It was, we used to have a plaque in my, um, my aunt, my aunt Karen was in this room right here and she had a little plaque on the wall. She was an AKA too. Had a plaque on the wall that said, service is love made visible. And I've always remembered that growing up. Service is love made visible. So the way that you show someone that you love them is that you serve them. You provide them service or you give service to them. So that was just kind of the, the motto kind of for our household was that this is how you show that you care about something, that you go out and you do something about it. You don't just sit in the living room and complain that this, this is horrible. I can't believe this happened. This is 
what, what can you do to fix it? If you care about it that much, then what are you going to do? So that's kind of the, the activism. And just knowing people might, you know, because of the way my grandfather was positioned with um, LBJ, we just knew people, you know, coming home from study um, afternoon, you know, after the end of the school day, then you could have extended study. It wasn't like detention or something, but it was like extended study for extra credit or something. And I'd do that and I'd ride the late bus home and I'd walk into the house and Ambassador Andrew Young is sitting in my living room. And I go, what? <laughs> They're like, this is Andrew Young. Hello, how are you? We're just talking and I'm going, okay, did they just say ambassador? They said ambassador Andrew Young. Is that who that is? And, and at the time, of course, I'm going in my head, that doesn't make sense that an ambassador is in my house. And not just the fact that Andrew Young was in my house. So, you know, it's just that, that kind of stuff. Just weird stuff like that. Knowing... Um, uh, Myra McDaniel went to my, my church and she's the first black secretary of state. Knowing her at church, knowing who she was. Um, one of, I don't know if she was my mom's classmate, but uh, someone else from Austin, A.Z. Taylor Morton, was the first black treasurer of the United States. So she, her signature was on the money when I was in elementary school and junior high school. And my family knew this person. And then me blurting that out in school class one day and the teacher saying, oh, why would you say that? Don't make up stories. And then I'm going, no, it's true. And then having to do a report about A.Z. Taylor Morton to prove that I knew her, bring her her picture with her signature and a little personal note to Gina and then her signature and then showing the dollar bill. This is her signature, that kind of thing. It's just, it was just the, the place that I was fortunate enough to be born into. That was just their whole mold was public service and what can you do to make the country and your neighborhood and your the world a better place the kind of place that you want it to be so even though you say you know it's not your bag have there been any causes along the way that you did get riled up about ah uh, let's see i don't really think so I would, <laughs> I would really kind of follow along with whatever the family was doing. Even now, we have elections, and I, I come and sit with mom one afternoon and say, now tell me about this person, tell me about that, what is going on with this person, and she tells me what she thinks, and then I go look and try to figure it out, but it's just not. <laughs> I think that at the point at which I got really kind of political, because there was some stuff that I really didn't have any control over, like the Miss uh, Miss America pageant was like a big deal growing up. It was a big deal. And we'd sit and we'd watch it, my grandmother and I, and we'd watch it and it would, who's going to win? And we'd take notes and that kind of thing. And when Vanessa Williams won, it was, I mean, it was like my heart was bursting that the, the female role model of the United States of America was this black woman who was poised and elegant and beautiful and articulate. <laughs> She was articulate and and it was just a beautiful thing. And and so I got riled up about stuff like that. The first time that I really got involved like politically would have to be in 2008 when Obama ran. And I actually went of my own accord to a campaign office and stuffed pay flyers and did, did that kind of stuff because before it had always been I was being dragged along with someone else. But I went and I sat down and I did this and I did that. and entered databases and just had this great time because it was one of those those pivotal moments in American culture that our generation just hadn't had yet. I mean, Vanessa Williams was one thing. And of course, then there was all the fallout with her. <laughs> it always happened. To, and I had to defend her to this day. Her crown was not taken away from her. She relinquished her crown for the betterment of the competition. She was like, I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to let it be a big deal. I'm going to relinquish my crown. I remember the press conference. Remember it because that was the day my heart broke. But um, yeah, really having a having a chance to say, because every middle class black child growing up was told, baby, you can be whatever you want to be. You could be the president of the United States. Every middle class child was told that growing up. So having this actually be that someone was actually going to be the president of the United States was huge. It was so huge. So that was the first time I actually got behind a big cause. Um, even when my mother ran for school board when I was in junior high school and I just wasn't, 
finish. I was just, I was just not impressed. I, like, I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why we have to take these pictures. Why are we watching these polls again? I just, I just wasn't ever into. It's just not something that gets me excited. I, I guess I, I, I'm more willing to buy into a cause that that someone else has initiated if it looks like something that I, well, that I dreamed of as a child. I guess is what it is. And there's just not a lot of that going on anymore. Um, I should have been an adult in the 70s because I think I would have, <laughs> I think I would have been raising all kinds of hell. But, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, there just wasn't a lot happening. So, um, so talk to me about... Well, the next, in, just in my, following my little list, it talks mm -hmm. about personal experiences about race in Austin um, that impact you and that impact the community. So a lot of our discussion has been kind of the past and, and growing up. Mm -hmm. And this kind of even for me calls back to that navigating this, navigating an Anglo city. And so mm -hmm. I guess the question is, do you feel like there has been change? Do you feel like where do you feel like we lay, we lay as a community right now and and what sort of change um do you feel like is is necessary and and kind of thinking about that and answering that calling back to maybe some um personal places personal experiences and stories okay um i i really feel like in truth austin has gone backwards like way backwards. I don't mean like 10, 15 years backwards. I mean like 50, 75 years backwards. Because even though we have this wonderful tagline and marketing that we're diverse and we accept all kinds of people and everybody's welcome and it's just, it's just not that way. It's just, it's just not that way. And the Austin that I grew up in was much more honest than the Austin that we live in now. The Austin that I grew up in, there were very clear boundaries about where you could be and where you couldn't be about using those languages when you were supposed to be speaking a certain way and when you were supposed to speak a different way. Um, it was very kind of clear. There was much more diversity in Austin than there used to be. Um, with Bergstrom Air Force Base, there were a lot of um, officers of color that lived out in out towards 183. Um, in just being around professional men of color and having, you know, a young man walking down the street in his Air Force uniform who was black, that's a role model for, for children to see that. We don't see that anymore. Um, it could be considered a plus. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that desegregation, the way that it was rolled out, was not beneficial for uh, people of African descent because it, it it kind of set a I don't even know how to say it. There used there used to be that we had black doctors, black lawyers, black dentists, black pharmacists, um, black grocery store owners, you know, black college, black high school, black junior high school teachers who wanted to make sure that their their children knew how to navigate that world but then also had pride in the world that they grew up in and their and their heritage that had pride in all that we desegregated and we closed the black high school we closed the black junior high school we closed the black hospital the black doctors the black lawyers were passed over because in a certain aspect the Anglo doctor and lawyer was better than the black doctor and lawyer. So now that we have access to the white doctor, let's go to the white doctor. Um, so it wasn't necessarily good in the sense that it, the way that it happened was not that we just said white folks have to allow black people and other people of color the same freedoms that they have been having ever since the Revolutionary War. You have to give them the same rights. Instead of saying that, they said, okay, well, we'll just close your stuff and use our stuff because your stuff is inherently not as good as our stuff is. So then that be becomes the downfall of the black community in any neighborhood, in any city, 
if you're told that your that your products and services are not as good as these products and services, then of course everybody goes to the other ones. And so at the same time, you know, Austin Regional Clinic has this very diverse workforce and I can go look at their database and say, oh, there's someone from East India and there's someone from from Croatia or there's someone from Louisiana or California or Singapore. I can go find the doctor of my flavor that I that I wanted to use and still walk into a restaurant and have people stop and look at me like, oh my gosh, there's a black person in the restaurant. <laughs> And being in a restaurant and being the only black person in that restaurant, being the only person of color in that restaurant, other than maybe the busboy, maybe the kitchen staff, but in the actual house of the restaurant, being the only person of color. And, and you kind of think in a city where we say we're, we're one of the most diverse cities of our size, well, then how is it that I walk into this restaurant and I don't see any people of color? How, how does that happen? Um, how can you be in a, in a high school and have a classroom that is all one culture, all one race, race we know is not real, but of, of one cultural background. If you're walking into a high school classroom and everybody's Anglo, then that's not a diverse city. If everybody's Latino, if everybody's black, that's not a diverse city. But that seems to be, and I don't mean, you know, we got 20 kids in the classroom and 19 are white and one's black. That doesn't count. <laughs> to have some kind of, of equanimity in, in classrooms. And I think that's the, the easiest way to see kind of diversity is to look at what's happening in a, in a classroom. Go into a classroom and look at that public school classroom. What does that look like? And if that's not diverse, then you can't really say that your that your city is diverse. Um, as much as I hated being bused over to West Austin, getting rid of the busing in Austin has been the downfall of all the schools on the east side. Because when they were busing, not only were kids from East Austin being bused West, but kids from West Austin were being bused East. And so Johnston had had families and children who had parents who could afford to take off in the middle of the day to come talk to their teacher and say, this is not working, you have to do this. And because that one child or three children had their parents come in, then that entire classroom got the benefit because the teacher had to change the way they were teaching. Now you have all these people that are just right there in the neighborhood and you have parents who can't take off work. They can't afford to take off work to come talk to the kids. They can't afford to join a parent teacher association. They can't, um, they can't afford to buy, you know, the shoelaces, the fat shoelaces and the school colors. You know, I need to buy sneakers. I can't buy shoelaces. I need to buy sneakers. Um, and then that school suffers. You know, we've already had one, two, three, I believe in my lifetime, and I could be wrong, but I believe in my lifetime we've had three school shutdowns on the east side. And I cannot count one school that's been shut down in West Austin. And then they do stupid stuff. Like they, they say, say John, we're going to shut down Johnston and then rename it East Side Memorial High School. But that's all we're doing. I mean, are these, are you re-interviewing teachers? Are you re-interviewing uh, principals? Are you re-interviewing staff? Are you setting an agenda? Are you doing something other than just saying, oh, Johnson is closed because Johnson didn't perform well. Well, Eastside Memorial is not performing well either, is it? So what point was it to eradicate what Johnson must have been built in the, oh, I don't know, but years and years of history behind this name is eradicated so we can change it to Eastside Memorial and you still haven't made a difference in the lives of these children. You know, they had a championship football team. I had a friend that was on the championship football team and I asked him, and I was like, where are y'all's y'all trophies? He's like, I don't even know. He's like, I didn't even know they were shutting the school down. Well, they didn't shut the school down. They just changed the name. That's all they did. And you kind of go, what? It, it, it goes back to when old Anderson gets closed and they build new Anderson in West Austin and the city just lets old, the building just go to rot and we're just not going to do anything about it. It's that same kind of pattern. Um, and it, we're still the most, we're one of the most diverse cities in the South and one of the most diverse cities of our size. And you're just kind of going, well, not, not really. It just kind of harkens back to that news versus reality thing. Exactly. Again, exactly. A different pitch. 
we have decided that Austin is this wonderful, great place. So this is what we're going to say. And then people are going to believe us. And then more people are going to move here. But if you notice, more Anglo people will move here. People of color do not move here because there's, I don't know if you can call it a grapevine, but people here, people call to find out, well, who do I know in Austin? They're offering me this great job. Who do I know that knows somebody or something? And even if they're in Houston or Dallas, somebody knows somebody that knows about Austin. People on the ground will tell the truth. People will say it's really not as nice as they make it out to be. It can still be very, very difficult. We still have young black and brown men being killed by the police. You know, just a year ago, we had someone shot in the back by an Austin police officer who still hasn't gone on trial. And you just kind of go, what, really? It's 2013. How, how does that happen? How does that happen? And the other interesting thing is that we have, um, we had that happen in Austin. We have the Trayvon, Trayvon, um, I can't remember his last Martin. name. Trayvon Martin story happened and that becomes world news basically, as it should, rightly. We had a young black man being shot in the back or six, seven years ago, a young black man being shot in the backseat of a car while he was asleep. And those things don't seem to get out of Austin. You know, I don't hear about them in Houston or Dallas. I hear about stuff that happens in Dallas and Austin, but people in Dallas don't hear about what happened in Austin. And it's just kind of puzzling that we've insulated ourselves so well as this progressive, modern, accepting city. And yet the reality is just completely, completely different, (laughs) completely different. And it's just, it's just weird. It's just, and Austin is weird. I mean, Rightly so, <laughs> you know, keep it awesome. We're, rightly so, we are a strange, strange city. Especially in the fact that when I was saying when I was younger, the lines were more clearly defined and you felt more secure about what you were doing and where you were going because you, you knew what the boundaries were. You knew automatically. Whereas today, you go somewhere and you walk in and you get that feeling and you just kind of go, okay, I'm really not welcome here. And you have to kind of make the decision. Am I going to just take a stand and sit down and order food and eat and have my go on with my life? Or am I just too tired to deal with that today? And sometimes you just are. Sometimes you're just like, I, I'm turn around and walk out. I don't even care. Just not going to deal with it today. So yeah, I don't, I don't particularly like what Austin has become. Do you feel like you're here to stay though? Yes. Austin is my home. Austin is my home. I love Austin. My 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 biggest fantasy in life is I'm gonna I'm gonna win the lottery. I'm gonna win hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm gonna be able to give you know three quarters of it away because nobody needs that much money. And part of the, one of the things that I'm gonna do is start buying up all these beautiful houses. Austin has some of the most beautiful architecture, and we're just throwing it away to give these developers room to build these high rises in this density. And I'm going, why would you tear that down? It's the most beautiful thing. So I'm going to buy a property that I think is beautiful and, and help diversify the city. I don't know if I can say I'm only going to sell, I'm going to buy houses in like infield. I'm only going to sell them to black folks. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that legally, but in my head, it's a dream <laughs> just to kind of integrate the places that are, have been insulated and insular and they're just kind of, this is, this it's infield and nobody ever talks about infield. They just, it's infield. No, there's like, it's like paradise. It's, <laughs> nothing bad ever happens. If it does and it's because somebody's was gone for the week and their high school or their um, college children had come home and they had a big wild party. But that's like about as bad as it gets in infield. <laughs> It's one of those places that you're just kind of, you want to live in Enfield, you want to live in Cat Mountain. Growing up, those are the, those are the two places to be in Austin. <laughs> uh, so, I'm trying to think, you know, the next thing on my list, I feel like I, I got a pretty good idea of um, how Austin has changed or not. <laughs> um, so I guess maybe we'll just sum up. And so I think... I want to ask, is there anything else that you want to say, um, make sure that's communicated or, or talked about that we didn't get to cover today? Let's see. I love Austin. I love East Austin. Um, I think we could do better. I mean, there's always room for improvement. 
you can't say that it's anything's ever perfect. I'm sure it's not perfect in Enfield. You know, it's probably like the hills over there. <laughs> There's all kinds of internal drama that nobody knows about. But <laughs> um, I do wish that, that, that we could do better and be more honest about the issues that we face in terms of racial identity and, um, and cultural identity. We, I'm not going to say that we're not accepting of that because we are, we're, and I think that's kind of the bedrock that that diversity issue is built on is that because Austin is so weird, people are accepted. You may not be in a place where you necessarily feel comfortable. However, across the street, there's a place that you will feel comfortable that you can always find some place with acceptance and, um, but it's just, it's just not as diverse and accepting as the city marketers would have us believe, you know, not only for people of color, but for women, for people in the LGBTQ community. And that's one of the big things too, is that people are like, oh, Austin's so progressive and they're so forward and they don't have any issues with, with, with homosexuality. And I'm going, yeah, do you have any friends that are gay? Because <laughs> it's, it can be very restricting. It can be very restricting. You need to be in this mold or this mold or this mold or this mold. And if you don't fit in one of those and we don't, I'm not sure where you belong. So you need to find your own, so Austin has still got some issues that we don't, we don't really talk about, we don't really deal with. Um, and then we have some polarity in the sense that when people feel like they don't have the kind of acceptance that they need, then they build this little place over here that they can live in. And then the realtors build this place over here that they can live in because they are trying to make money. I, I need to make some money. What's the best place I can make? So they build this little place. And then people that work for the University of Texas, they have they have this little place over here. And the people that work for Houston Tillerson University have this place over here. So we have these little constructs of communities that don't ever really connect well together, which is another thing that's unfortunate. And part of that has to do with just the way that Austin was built. You know, it has to do with our city planning and or lack thereof. Um, so we need more planning around being intentional about cultural diversity and sexual diversity and all that kind of stuff. We're just not intentional about it. And I think that's one of the ways that, that Austin really could improve and really become the kind of city that we would like it to be is if we just were brave enough to sit down and say, this is a problem. This is a problem. Um, it's just not acceptable in any form or fashion for a person of any color to be shot in the back. It's just not, it's just not okay. It's just not okay. And the fact that we have a, 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 a society in our city that, that doesn't see the, the injustice in the number of shootings that have, that have occurred between people of, of um, African descent or Latino descent and the people who are Anglo, just that disparity and you can't even say well there's more crime and no because there's not because <laughs> they're not our crime statistics are pretty there's pockets here and there's pockets there and there's pockets there and there's pockets so you can't say that this group of people is doing something that's going to make it more likely that they get shot um you know it's just being sure that we don't feed back into the 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 marketing viewpoint of who we are focusing so much time and energy on development improvement of sixth street which is basically bars so they're drinking and that's the whole point of going down to sixth street is to drink but we pour so much money into that small district around sixth street that has nothing to do with really developing the the cultural soul of the city because that's just a that's just a stopping point and we used to have you know real talented artistic people with shops down on 6th street and now there's what maybe two since a long i've been down on 6th street but like brian joseph is gone i know um and they're just the stained glass lady i think is gone you just don't have the culture anymore it's just we're drinking and that's what made austin special was that you could go drink but you could watch somebody paint this fabulous portrait or or create this blown art that was gorgeous. And we're just, we, we're losing that because of trying to fit in with what 
marketing says we are. Just like the the news being the reality or reality being the news. Marketing has decided this is what we are, so we're going to try to fit into that. We're going to bring in Formula One, and we're going to do make Southwest bigger, South by Southwest bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but we're not feeding the soul of Austin anymore. We're pushing those those people who are who are Austinites at heart, who are quirky and want to do their own thing and speak out for justice and peace and and uh, social awareness and activism. Those people are being pushed out of the city because it's so expensive now. But then also because I just don't think that there's there's room for that anymore. It's like it's we've decided we've made a decision about what Austin is, and if you're anything other than what fits into that portrait, then we we just can't help you in terms of a on a large scale city level. We're just not gonna the music. We were just talking about with the music. These people are making money. It's not like they're they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing it to make money. They're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, then they wouldn't be charging you $175 <laughs> to get into something. They're they're trying to make money, and yet they want money from the city. And you just kind of go, what? And then the city buys into it because we're the live music capital of the world, and the way that we prove that is that the city invested $4.5 billion million into music last year. And you go, and what did that get the city? Did we develop another Stevie Ray Vaughan? Did we develop, did develop a Janis Joplin? Did we develop someone who is now saying Austin is this great place because I'm quirky and I'm weird and I was accepted and it's going to be okay? No, we're not doing that. We're just, who's the biggest star we can get this year and how much can we make people pay for? So I want Austin to go back to the way it was. <laughs> I want it to go back to the old Austin. <laughs> As, as as odd as that sounds, I just I, I really think we were we were better off and we were just kind of a little podunk city. When Houston and Dallas, you why is the capital in Austin? Austin's not even a real city. That's okay. We're not a real city, but we're doing just fine. <laughs> we're doing just fine, <laughs> and we're just not that anymore. We're we're competing to be, you know, people's top top urban city for nineteen for 2014 and that's just not a competition I think we should be in if we're going to stay weird then stay weird fight to stay off those charts <laughs> fight to not be fight to be the city that no one wants to move to because it's just too weird <laughs> I'm from out of town I'm just not accepted in Austin anymore <laughs> Closing, we're going to close the borders that's what we do that's what we do we find the Austin city limits and we just close the borders and even that, Austin City Limits, it's, it's not Austin City War. <laughs> just breaks your heart. Breaks your heart. I was so proud when I, went, I went off to college in North Carolina and I was just flipping through stations and, and it was Austin City. I said, oh my gosh, Austin City Limits is on in North Carolina. What? And I was, I was so excited. But then now, it's a whole industry. It's an entire industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.